So good evening, everyone. Once again, welcome back to Focus the Future Dentistry webinars. Today's session will be on pediatric space management by Dr. Sharon C. Jones. She completed her BDS from Calicut GDC and MDS in pediatrics from Mar Business General College, Kodamangala. She's more into researches and publications. She got her research piece apart for best researcher in pediatric dentistry. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, for your kind words. I hope I'm audible to you all. Am I loud and clear to you all? You can hear me, right? Okay. So today our topic is on pediatric and preventive dentistry. So pedo is actually one topic in which you need to cover a lot of headings. Like, in fact, it is a uh, child dentistry. It covers almost the entire adult dentistry in a nutshell. That means you have got important topics in pedo from endodontics. Then you have trauma part, which is important. You have orthodontic part, which is again important. So you have uh, a lot of topics in pedo as a, uh, as a very, very important for your neat entrance exam, especially the endo parts and the trauma part. So in the last exam, that is in the 2021 NEET exam, if you observe, you can see that there were two questions, two or three questions from space management alone. So that again is an important topic for you. So today we will be having a brief and short description on pediatric space management and about the space maintainers. So I think it's time and we'll start with today's topic. So today's topic is on pediatric space management. So in pediatric space management, you need to know a lot of first, first thing that you need to know in pediatric space management is what happens when there is an early loss of primary tooth. The first thing that you need to know is that whenever there is an early loss of primary tooth, you know that what happens, it will affect the alignment of the permanent dentition that is next to the edentular space. Definitely there will be a tooth tilting. And as shown in the picture, you can expect a supra eruption of the opposing teeth, a mesial inclination of the tooth that is mesial inclination of the tooth that is distal to the space, distal inclination of the tooth that is mesial to the space. And what will be the end result? The end result will be that you will get a locked out premolar or a locked out permanent successor. So it can either, there will be a deviation in its path of eruption and it may either erupt buccally or lingually or it may be remain locked out. So this is the importance of a space maintainer or a space management. So whenever there is an early loss of primary tooth prior to its shedding time, all these ill effects it can lead to. So now we'll see what are the main factors that affects the planning of a space maintainer. So uh, over the previous AIPG and NEET papers, if you observe, you can see that there are a lot of questions from space maintainers. So in my presentation, those things which are marked in a different color, that is something like in a red color or in a bold marking, all those were repeated questions for the previous years. Okay, so now we'll start with the factors affecting planning for a space maintainer. So according to McDonald and Avery, if a space closure is about to occur, that usually takes place within six months after the loss of the tooth. Okay, this is an important MCQ for you. Maximum space closure for following extraction is occurring within six months after the loss of the tooth. And also the tendency for space closure is more rapid in the maxillary arch when compared to that of the mandibular arch. Another important question for you, the, the space closure is more, com more rapid in the maxillary arch when compared to that of the mandibular arch. When it comes to space maintainers, like you can get questions like um, true or false questions, How, which among the following statement is true, which among the following statement is false and all right. So all these, uh, in these important points can be one among the option. So keep in mind, if a space closure is going to occur, the maximum space closure will be occurring within the first six months after the loss of the tooth. And also the tendency for space closure is more rapid in the maxilla when compared to that of your mandibular arch. Now, the next thing that you need to know if whether if the teeth is actively erupting adjacent to the area left by the primary tooth. So as I've already mentioned, uh, whenever there is a loss of a primary tooth, there is a high chance for a, the, dis, the tooth distal to the space as well as the tooth mesial to the space, they can shift to that position. 
So the space loss is maximum when the teeth is actively erupting adjacent to the area left by the primary tooth. So that is typically the space loss is maximum before or during the eruption of your first permanent molar. Space loss is maximum during or before the eruption of first permanent molar. And also the space loss is less if the permanent molars are fully erupted at the time of the primary tooth loss. Okay, if the primary two molars are fully erupted at the time of the primary tooth uh, loss, the space closure is much less when compared to that of an erupting teeth adjacent to the area left by a primary tooth. So these are the things that you need to know most importantly in planning the space maintainers. Okay. Now, the next important point is again an important MCQ question for your NEET exam, for your AIMS exam, for your INI set exam, everything. So the maximum space is lost during the first six months of extraction of the primary tooth and most immediate loss is within 76 hours after the extraction. Okay, keep this thing in mind. It is very, very important for you. The maximum space is lost within the first six months of extraction and the most immediate loss is occurring within 76 hours of extraction. Okay, keep this in mind. The rate of space closure, very, very important MCQ for your neat entrance exam. Now moving on to the next question, that is the amount of bone coverage over the tooth. So according to McDonald, one mm of bone, that is the amount of bone coverage over the tooth is one factor, which always uh, you depend on before planning for a space maintainer. That is, if a tooth is about to erupt soon, do you need a space maintainer? No. So how do you decide that radiographically? Radiographically, you decide that by knowing the amount of bone coverage over the tooth. So according to McDonald, one mm of bone resorbs in four to five months. Very, very important MCQ question for you. It takes four to five months for resorption of even one mm of bone over the erupting permanent tooth. Okay, four to five months for the uh, resorption of one mm of bone. So this is another important factor uh, prior to the player that you decide uh, prior to the placement of a space maintainer. I hope I am clear to you all till now. Now moving on to the amount of space closure. So amount of space closure, as I've already mentioned, whenever there is an erupting tooth adjacent to the uh, space loss, there is high chance or there is maximum amount of space closure is occurring at that time. So this is an important MCQ for you. That is loss of a maxillary second primary molar that results in the greatest amount of space closure. And that measures up to about eight mm of space loss in one quadrant. Okay, loss of a maxillary second primary molar results in the greatest amount of closure, measures up to 8 mm in one quadrant. And at the same time, the mandibular molars, they show the greatest amount of space loss, next greatest, and that is measured up to 4 mm in a quadrant. Okay, so amount of space closure, maximum, uh, a maximum space loss is caused by a missing maxillary second primary molar prior to the eruption of your first permanent molar, followed by your mandibular second primary molar prior to the eruption of your uh, first permanent molar. So these are the main factors that which you decide before planning your space maintainer. Okay, so Please repeat which top, uh, which point do you want to repeat? The amount of space closure? The amount, okay. The amount of space closure, as I've already mentioned earlier, whenever there is an erupting tooth adjacent to your extraction space, what is happening? There is a tooth erupting adjacent to, the, to your lost primary tooth space. So there will be drifting of that permanent tooth. The permanent tooth bud will be pushing this, pushing and will try to close the space. So the maximum amount of space closure is occurring when there is a loss of a maxillary second primary molar. And then comes the mandibular second primary molar and it measures the space loss is measured up to 4 mm in one quadrant. I hope I'm clear to you Shubham. Shubham is the top. Is it clear to you? Okay. 
Now we'll move on to where, how do you decide in planning to place a space maintainer? You do the first thing that you do is a model analysis. So you do an analysis, and if you see a positive arch length, or is there, or if there is a deficiency of less than one to two mm of space per quadrant, you go ahead with a space maintainer to hold the tooth. And if the arch length deficiency is about two to three mm per quadrant or more, you have to think about other options like space regaining, serial extraction, or a comprehensive orthodontic treatment. Okay, again, all these are important for your MCQ, MCQ point of view. If there is a positive arch length or, is there, or if there is a space deficiency of less than one to two mm, you can go ahead with a space maintainer. And if the arch length deficiency is two to three mm or more, you have to think about there is no point in just holding the space alone. You need more space, right? So you have to think about other options like space regaining, serial extraction, or a comprehensive comprehensive orthodontic treatment. So this is how you decide whether you go for a space maintainer or not. So we'll see what are the common and the commonly fixed and removable space maintainers. I hope I am clear to you all regarding the factors that you decide on uh, taking a space maintainer. So you have a lot of important MCQs from that aspect. I hope I am clear to you about all those, the bone resorption, the maximum space closure, most immediate loss, everything. I hope I am clear to you all. Shall I move on to the next topic? Shall I just continue? Okay, so we'll uh, go ahead with the space maintainers. So you have fixed space maintainers as well as removable space maintainers, okay? So removable space maintainers, as the name says, you can remove the space maintainer. So it can be again functional and non-functional. You call a space maintainer functional if it serves a function, that is a tooth is incorporated. Then you call it a functional space maintainer. And if there is no tooth, you call it as a non-functional space maintainer. So most most of the space maintainers that we study, the fixed space maintainers like your band and loop, your nance palatal arch, your trans palatal arch, lingual arch, everything are non-functional type of a space maintainer. And you have a one, you have a single cantilever type of space maintainer that is a distal shoe space maintainer. Okay, so I think we'll move ahead with the first. We'll see the armamentarium that you need in the in the fabrication of a space maintainer. In the last NEET exam itself, we have got a question about the rubber dam retainer and the rubber dam forceps, right? So the armamentarium, what you use is also very important for you. You should be able to identify these things. So the first, the, so the first image that is, and also you know that you get a lot of image-based questions in your NEET. So you have to tackle all those image-based questions because they are very easy to answer if you know the answer. So the first thing that you need to know in the armamentarium is a hope layer. So this is the picture of a hope layer. So as shown in the picture, the function of a hope layer is pinching. You can do a pinching with the hope layer. You can uh, try to flatten the contact area with the hope layer. It has got multiple functions. So utility player in which you can use it for anything. So this is the picture of a hope layer. You can have a straight hoe as well as a curved hoe. It has got a serrated end and it is rounded. Towards the end, it is rounded so that it produces minimal patient discomfort. So keep the picture in mind. This is the picture of a hoe plier. Now, the next armamentarium that you need to know in a uh, space maintainer is your band pinching plier. So this band pinching player, as the name says, it is also used for a final pinching. When you adapt the band around the tooth, you need a final pinching. The first pinching, you do it with a hoe player. What is the purpose of this pinching? The pinching is done so that you get a tightened band around the tooth. You need a close approximation between the band and the tooth. So a final pinching is done with the help of a peat player or what you call a band pinching player. So this is the image of a band pinching player and it has got a depression, a concave surface and all this helps in adapting the band properly around the tooth. So keep in mind, this is the picture of a band pinching player. Now, Next thing that you need to know in the armamentarium is your three-prong plier. 
So this is the image of a three pronged player. You have to keep in mind as the name says, it has got three ends. That is why it is called a three pronged player. One end, second end and the third end. This is called a three pronged player. And a three pronged player is typically used in forming loops. When you do a band and loop space maintainer, you need certain point bends around the loop. So that is done with the help of a three pronged player. Yes, this is the name of a peak player. This is a band pinching player. Okay, band pinching player is otherwise called a peak player. It is different from a bird beak player. You call, you call this player as a peak player. Okay, now this is the image of a three prong player. Okay, three prong player, as, a, as the name says, you have got three ends, one, two, and three. Okay, three ends are there and that helps in forming the loop of your band and loop. Now, moving on to the next armament theorem, this is the image of a Mershon band pusher. So it has got a cylindrical end. It has got one side a cylindrical. This is the place where we hold the band pusher and it has got a serrated end. Its main function is to adapt the band properly to form a proper contour of the band around the tooth. So that is the function of a Mershon band pusher. So keep the image in mind. This is the picture of a band pusher. Okay, this is a Mershon band pusher. Now, next thing that you need to know is your Johnson's contouring player. So the Johnson's contouring player, as the picture says, it has got a concave end as well as a convex end. So the main function of a Johnson's contouring player is to form the, when, when you adapt it onto the gingival surface, you can properly contour it in the tooth, of, in the shape of the tooth itself. This is particularly helpful in the case of a preformed band. Okay, when you're doing a band adaptation, you don't generally require a Johnson's contouring player. But when you're working with a preformed band, you have to, or a ready-made band, you need a Johnson's contouring player to give the proper contouring around the tooth. So this is the picture of a Johnson's contouring player. It is the same player that we use as a contouring player in fabrication of stainless steel crown. Okay. Uh, this is the picture of a Johnson's contouring player. Uh, which topic should I repeat again? Is it the contouring player? Pusher. Okay, so this is the picture of a band pusher. So I repeat, it is the Mershon's band pusher. This is the cylindrical end where we hold it. This is the place where we hold this band pusher and it has got a serrated end. A cylindrical, it's almost cylindrical in shape and it has got a serrated end. The main function of a band pusher is like as in the name, it is used in helping to push the band. You can push the band around the contact area as well as adapt it properly following the contours of the tooth. Okay, so I hope I am clear to you now. So this is a Merchant's band pusher. Now, next thing is the Johnson's contouring player, which I've already mentioned. And now we move on to the next armamentarium thing, that is the crimping player. Crimping player also, you might have known this name in the fabrication of a stainless steel crown. Yes, it is the same crimping player. So you can see it has got a, no, it has got an end like this. So this is where, when you adapt it over the gingival third of the crown or the band, you can get a proper adaptation around the tooth. So that is the function of a crimping player. So crimping player and contouring player, in the case of a space maintainers also, we use the same thing that we use in the case of a stainless steel crown. So keep in mind of this picture, this is the picture of a crimping player. Okay, now that is, uh, so we are done with the armamentarium in the space maintainer part. And now we'll see the space maintainers, the brief and the most important points that you need to know in your entrance exam in the following. Okay, so the first space maintainer is a band and loop space maintainer. So you know it is a unilateral, non-functional, and it is a passive space maintainer. So all the fixed space maintainers are passive space maintainers because they generally, they don't create, well, when you call an appliance passive, when it is not in, when it is not causing any kind of pressure, right? That is one when you call a, a space maintainer as a passive one. Uh, crimping player, what is the confusion in crimping player? 
just have a look at the crimping player. You can see uh, it has got a notch kind of end. So when you place it around the gingival third of your crown or your band, you can get a proper adaptation of your band or your crown around the tooth. So that is the main function of a crimping player. Shubham, I hope I am clear to you now. This is the picture of a crimping player. Am I clear to you? Okay. So moving on to the band and loop space maintainer. So let's see what is the main indications of a band and loop space maintainer. So the indications like uh, what you have learned in your part two exam, you don't need to know that. You just need to uh, you just need to be able to answer the problem solving questions that you can expect from this point. Okay. So a band and loop space maintainer is generally used for unilateral space loss in both maxilla and mandible. It can also be given bilaterally. You can also give a band and loop space maintainer bilaterally also. So typically a band and loop space maintainer is used for a unilateral loss of your primary molar, especially a single primary molar. Now, it can also be given in bilateral cases of space loss or primary molar loss prior to the eruption of your permanent incisors. That is when, uh, if the incisors are erupted, what appliance you give? In bilateral loss, it is the liquid arch appliance. So generally, prior to the eruption of your permanent incisors, if there is a bilateral loss of the primary molar, you can go ahead with the band and loop space maintainer. Now, the last indication is that if a second molar is lost after the eruption of your first permanent molar, you can band around the first molar and give a loop. A loop that contacts the D. So these are the typical indications of a band and loop space maintainer. Now we'll see the picture based things. So this is the picture of a band and loop. You can see that a band, uh, usually the tooth that is distilled to the uh, edentulous or the extracted space is banded. And then you can see a loop that passes through the extraction space and contact the tooth that is anterior to the space. So this is the picture of a band and loop space maintainer, okay? So keep the picture in mind. You can see a band around the tooth and the loop that passes through the dentulous area and contact the tooth that is mesial to the extraction space. Then, then you need to know certain modifications in band and loop space maintainer. So the first modification in a band and loop space maintainer is a main space maintainer. So what is actually a main space maintainer? A main space maintainer, it's a space maintainer in which a band and loop in which the loop is halved. In this picture, you can see that only half of the loop is seen, right? One side, the loop is missing. In, the, in such, such kind of abandoned loop space maintainers, you call it as a main space maintainer. So if you get a picture like that, like this in your NEET exam, don't write it as a band and loop space maintainer. It is a modification of band and loop. That is, it is a main space maintainer. Okay, that's a band and loop space maintainer in which the loop is half. So what is the function of a main space maintainer? The main space maintainer is indicated if the abutment tooth is rotated. Okay, you can see a slight rotation in this tooth, right? And if the abutment tooth is rotated or if the permanent tooth is almost erupting or when the loop is going to be a restriction for the eruption of the permanent tooth. So only in these three condition, you just have the band, the loop of the band and loop and the half loop band and loop is called a main space maintainer. I hope I'm clear to you all. If there is any confusion, you can uh, message in the chat box. Okay, so I hope this is clear. This is the picture of a main space maintainer. Now, next thing that you need to know is your crown and loop space maintainer. So what is actually a crown and loop space maintainer? Crown and loop space maintainer means that what you see, you first you see a crown. Then on top of the crown, a, a loop, a band is soldered and you can see a crown and loop space maintainer. Okay, so this is the picture of a crown and loop space maintainer. Now, the next type of uh, mo next modification of a band and loop is a reverse band and loop. So what is a reverse band and loop? Reverse band, normally what you do, you band the tooth that is distilled to the space, right? So in a reverse band and loop, you reverse it. So you band the tooth that is mesial to the uh, extraction space, and then you loop it, and the loop contacts the tooth that is distilled to the extraction space. So that is called a reverse band and loop. 
okay so this is called a reverse bandel loop so keep all these pictures in mind so the modifications of bandel loop you have got a main space maintainer when the loop is halved then you have got a crown and loop then you have got a reverse bandel loop there are two more modifications for bandel loop one is a band and bar that means in the uh, in the area where the tooth is missing you band both the tooth okay you band both the mesial tooth as well as the distal tooth Crown and loop is a functional one. Yes, crown and loop is a functional space maintainer. Okay, so this is a band and bar space maintainer. Band, band and bar means you band both the tooth, that is the tooth mesial to as well as the tooth distal to the space and you attach a bar. Band and bar is also a functional space maintainer because on top of the bar, you can attach a tooth. If you attach a tooth, it becomes a functional. So this is the picture of a band and bar space maintainer. Now, the next modification is the long band and loop. So, what is this picture show? If both D and E are missing, what you, it is not a normal band and loop, right? So, it is a long band and loop where the loop extends all over the extraction space of both D as well as E. Clinically, long band and loop is not that much indicated because the appliance is not that stable. Okay, yeah, the appliance is not stable. So generally you don't uh, go for a long band and loop, but you need to know this because it is a modification of your band and loop space maintainer. Okay, so that is it about the band and loop space maintainers. I hope I am clear to you all. Now we'll see what is the next space maintainer that is a lingual arch space maintainer. So lingual arch means it is a bilateral space maintainer in the mandibular arch. Again, it is non-functional and it can be passive and active. In some cases, the lingual arch, you have a U loop. If there is a U loop, you can activate the appliance for minor space regaining. So it can be either passive or an active appliance and typically it is given in a mandibular arch. So whenever you get problem solving questions like multiple tooth loss, like if both D and D are missing, if the bilateral loss of both D and D or anything like that, if the age given is, uh, if the age given correspond to the eruption of your permanent incisors, then you can go for your lingual arch space maintainer. For example, if the child is around six years of age and then uh, six or five and a half years of age with just the uh, anterior tooth is not erupted, can you give a lingual arch space maintainer? No. In that case, you have to go for a band and loop space maintainer bilaterally. Okay, so at the same time, if the central incisors and the lateral incisors are erupted, and in that cases of bilateral space loss or multiple tooth loss, you can go ahead with the lingual arch space maintainer. Okay, so this is the importance of a problem solving question. You can get questions like this. Whenever it comes to space maintainer, always keep in mind about the age of the child. Okay, the age of the child, does it correspond to the age of the eruption of your permanent six as well as the permanent anterior? That is one thing that you have to keep in mind when you're uh, answering a problem solving question pertaining to the space maintainer. So these are the indications of a lingual arch space maintainer. So it is given in multiple loss, bilateral loss, unilateral loss after the eruption of the lower incisors as well as in minor space regaining. So I hope I'm clear to you about the lingual art space maintainer. So this is the picture of a lingual art space maintainer. You can see that both the tooth is banded and then it, like an arch wire, it passes on the lingual side contacting the cingulum of the uh, anterior tooth. So this is the picture of a lingual arch space maintainer. Okay, now if a lingual arch is having a U loop, you call it a hot lingual arch, okay? Lingual arch with the U loop is called a hot lingual arch. And the main function of a hot lingual arch is what? When the, whenever there is a U loop that shows that you can activate the appliance, right? You can activate the appliance and it can be used in minor space pregame. So that's it about the hot lingual arch. It's a modification of your lingual arch. That is a lingual arch with the U loop is referred to as a hot lingual arch. Now, next thing that you need to know is the Mersenne's modification of a lingual arch space maintainer. So this, I don't know, many of you might not be knowing about the Mersenne's modification. So it is important for your NEET exam because they, they always wanted to confuse you. Rather than asking direct questions of band and loop and lingual arch, they'll be asking something like this. 
So keep in mind, this picture is a Mersenne's modification in which in the lingual arch, spurs are placed distal to the canine. And that is particularly used in the case of loss of both primary first and second molars. Okay, so this is a Mersenne's modification. When you see a spur distal to the canine, a spur is placed distal to the canine. And if there is a bilateral loss of both deciduous molars, you give a modification like this. So the name of it is important. It is called a Mersenne's modification. Okay, so this is the Mersenne's modification of a lingual arch. So that is it about lingual arch. I hope I am clear to you all. And we'll see with the Nance palatal arch. So what is a Nance palatal arch? Nance palatal arch is a bilateral space maintainer that you give in maxilla. So this is the picture of a Nance palatal arch. So keep in mind, you have got an acrylic button here and you band the two molars. So Nance palatal arch is indicated in bilateral space loss in the maxillary arch. Keep the picture in mind. Okay, now the next space maintainer that you need to know is your transpalatal arch. So what is a transpalatal arch? Transpalatal arch is a unilateral space maintainer that you use in maxilla. So one important thing that you need to know about TPA is that it is introduced by gauche garian So it is otherwise called a gauche garian appliance. So rather than getting options directly like transpalatal arch, you can expect options as, op, um, in the options you can expect this name also, gauche garian appliance. Okay, so keep this, in my, keep this in mind. Very, very important question for you. Transpalatal arch is a unilateral space maintainer and it is otherwise called a gauche garian appliance. Okay, gauche garian appliance, uh, keep that in mind. Now moving on to the last type of space maintainer, that is a distal shoe space maintainer. So what is a distal shoe space maintainer? A distal shoe space maintainer is an intra-alveolar appliance. That is, the other appliances, they are not going deep into your bone or gingiva or anything like that. So distal shoe is the only uh, space maintainer which is intra-alveolar. Okay, it is a cantilever type of space maintainer as well as it is otherwise called an intra-alveolar appliance. Just like your gauche garian appliance, when you get an option like intra-alveolar appliance, you have to think about the distal shoe. So what is the indication of a distal shoe? A distal shoe is indicated whenever there is a premature loss of your second primary molar prior to the eruption of your permanent first molar. So in regarding the treatment planning, I've already explained to you that whenever there is an erupting permanent tooth adjacent to your deciduous tooth loss, there will be extensive space loss, right? Do you remember what was the space loss that is caused due to a second maxillary molar? Any one of you please, uh, please post in the chat box. The maximum amount of space closure caused in the uh, maxillary, caused due to the loss of maxillary second molar is a Yes, good. It is 8 mm. And in the mandibular arch, it is? Yes, good. It is 4 mm in the mandibular arch. So you keep in mind, distal shoe is an appliance that is given in the case of a premature loss of a second primary molar prior to the eruption of a permanent first molar. So distal shoe, every a lot of MCQs comes from distal shoe alone. So keep this thing in mind. Distal shoe was first reported by Villette. Okay. Villet was the person who introduced distal shoe. So the first appliance was a cast gold appliance. So being a gold appliance, it was disfavored due to increased cost of the appliance. Now what we use is the Rocher variant of the appliance. So a Rocher variety has got a V-shaped gingival extension while, while the Villet's one has got a bar type of gingival extension. Okay, all these points are very, very important for you. You study it now itself. Okay, it was first reported by Villette and it is a cast gold appliance. So it was disfavored due, due to its cost. Now what we follow is a Roche variant of a distal shoe, which has got a V-shaped gingival extension. At the same time, the Villette's one had got a bar type of gingival extension. So this is the picture of a distal shoe appliance. So it has got a horizontal part as well as a vertical part. So this vertical part, this, uh, this is the vertical part that we were mentioning about. Okay, keep this in mind. This is the picture of a distal shoe appliance. 
Now, in the case of a distal shoe, when you're giving a distal shoe in the mandibular arch, the contact area of this vertical extension of the appliance is slightly lingual to the crest of the alveolar ridge in the case of mandible, and it is slightly facial to the crest of the alveolar ridge. That is just to engage the mesial contact area of the erupting permanent first molar. Okay, the distal action, that, that is the contact area of the distal extension of the appliance, it is placed slightly lingual to the crest of the alveolar ridge in the case of a mandible and slightly facial to the crest of the alveolar ridge in the case of a maxillary appliance. Okay, so next important thing that you need to know in your distal shoe appliance is about the vertical bar. So this is the picture of a radiographic representation of a distal shoe. You can see a horizontal bar as well as a vertical bar. So this vertical bar's extension has been repeatedly asked in many of your entrance exam. So the vertical bar should extend one mm below the mesial marginal ridge of the first molar. If it is too long, it will harm the second premolar. And if it is too too short, the first, first molar can erupt under the appliance. So these are the problems uh, regarding the extension of your vertical bar. It should extend 1 mm below the mesial marginal ridge of the first molar. And also, being an intraalveolar appliance, the distal shoe has got some contraindications. That is, if there is inadequate abutment, if it, there is poor oral hygiene, if it is a medically compromised patient like a coronary artery disease or a heart uh, CHF, kidney problems, diabetes, rheumatic fever, in all these cases, distal shoe is contraindicated. So that is it about the space maintainers. Now, one more thing that you need to know is about the space regainer. Space regainer is a different topic. I have just shown you just one picture of it so that you don't confuse it with a band and loop. Here also you can see a banding around the tooth and some kind of loop is there. But you can see that this is a coiled spring. This coil spring shows that the appliance is active. And this is the picture of a Gerber's space regainer. Don't confuse it with the band and loop. That is why I'm including it in the, the, including the picture here. Please don't confuse it with the band and loop. If there is a spring wound over it, you know that the appliance is active. So it cannot be a space maintainer. Okay, so it has to be a space regainer. So this is the picture of a Gerber's space regainer. So now we'll move on to the questions for the session. So first question, after premature removal of a primary tooth, the maximum amount of space closure occurs in the first? Yes, very good. It, is, it occurs within the first six months and most immediate loss occurs within how many hours? Yes. Six months and seven, no, it is not 72. Many of you are getting confused again. Six months and 76. That is how you should remember. Okay, 76 hours and six months. Immediate loss is within 76 hours and the maximum amount of space closure occur in the first six months. That is why you have to give a space maintenance soon. Because if you are asking for the if you are asking the patient to come review after six months, will there be any purpose? No. Maximum amount of space closure is occurring in the first six months. Keep that in mind. First six months and the most immediate loss is within 76 hours. Now, moving on to the second question. An unerupted premolar usually takes how many months to travel through one mm of bone? Yes, correct again. It is four to five months. An uninterrupted premolar takes four to five months to travel through one mm of bone. Okay, it takes usually one, it takes four to five months to travel through one mm of bone. Now, next question. The appliance shown in the figure was introduced by Yes. What is this appliance otherwise called? This appliance is otherwise called? Yes, transpalatal arch. What is the indication of a transpalatal arch? Yes, unilateral space loss in maxilla. That is the indication of a transpalatal arch. So the answer for this question is Robert A. Ghosh-Garian. Now, 
amount of space closure after the premature extraction of a primary tooth is Yes, correct. It is more in maxilla. And that too, the maximum is with the loss of maxillary second deciduous molar. And its value is, what is the value? You have already answered prior. The value in the, the second deciduous maxillary molar is lost is, yes, correct. It is 8 mm. And in the case of a mandibular second deciduous molar, it is 4 mm. Very good. Now moving on to the next question. So you can expect these type of problem solving questions in your need. So Jennifer aged four has a badly broken second molar with pulpal degeneration that has to be extracted. The type of space maintainer indicated is. So in kind of problem solving question, every single word is important. As I've already discussed, every word is important. The child is of age four. So what does child is of age four? So in age four, do you expect a, a pus, what are the tooth that you expect? It is a badly broken second molar. Yes, correct. It is, I got one correct answer from Nandini. Dr. Nandini, you are right. It is a, it is a distal shoe intraalveolar appliance. What is the confusion in this question? See, the child's age is four years. So in four years, do you uh, do a, a second, first permanent molar erupt? No. So what is the indication of a distal shoe space maintainer actually? It is indicated in the case of a deciduous second molar loss prior to the eruption of your first permanent molar. So that is the clue that is given here. The child's age is four years. That is, there is no erupted permanent first molar. Then how can you give a banded loop? You cannot give a band and loop. You have to give a distal shoe appliance. Is the, is the question clear to you all? Because I got a many multiple answers in this question. Is the question clear to you? Yes. So that is how you should approach a problem solving question. The age is important. The tooth that is involved is important. And then you go to the type of space maiden. So keep in mind, age is four. That shows that your permanent molar is not erupted. So without eruption of a permanent first molar, can you give a band and loop from a primary first molar to the approximate area? No. The better appliance is the distal shoe intraalveolar appliance. Now, going on to the next question. The depth of the distal shoe into the gingiva to guide the unerupted first permanent molar should be? Yes, this everybody is correct, uh, saying the correct answer. The answer is one mm below the mesial marginal ridge of the first molar. Correct answer. Now, what is this player called? We'll just have a quick review through the pictures that we have covered. Yes, very good. It is a three prong plier. Okay, now what is this called? What is this appliance called? Yes, it is a Mersenne's modification of a lingual arch. So, what is a Mersenne's modification? You can see the spurs that are seen distal to the canine, and that is given in the case of both deciduous first and second molar loss. Okay, so this is a Mersenne's modification of a lingual arch. Now, what is the, both the appliance? The first appliance is a the first appliance is a passive appliance, and that is a band and loop. Now, what is the second appliance? The second picture is Yes, good. The second picture is a Gerber's space regener. So when you closely look, you, they look similar. Right? They look alike, but one is passive. The other is an active appliance and the active space maintainer is a space regainer. So this is the picture of a Gerber's space regainer. Now, what is this picture? What is this appliance? Yes, very good. It's a hot lingual arch. That is a U loop is there. So it's a modification of the lingual arch. It is a hot lingual arch. Now, what is this appliance called? Yes, it is a main space maintainer. It is a band and loop space maintainer when you were with the whenever the loop is halved. 
So where is it typically indicated if the permanent molar, premolar is almost erupting and if the adjacent tooth is rotated, you use a main space maintainer. So this is the modification of a banded loop space maintainer. Now, moving on to the uh, next picture. So what apply, what plier was this? Yes, correct. It's a whole player and its main function is in pinching your band. Okay. It mainly, it is actually whole player is a utility player where you can have, it has got multiple actions. So the main function pertaining to band and look, pertaining to your space maintainer is in pinching your band. Now, the last question, the space maintainer of choice when a bilateral primary mandibular first molars are missing after the eruption of your permanent first molars. Bilateral primary mandibular first molars are missing after the eruption of your permanent first molars. Bilateral. It is liquid large. Band and loop can be used as a bilateral space maintainer, but that is prior to the eruption of your central incisors. Okay, then only you give a band and loop bilaterally or else a universal bilateral slot space maintainer is a lingual arch. Okay, whenever there is an option like a lingual arch, you have to pick lingual arch. Yes, you can give two bilateral band and loops that is there, but that is not generally indicated. You give two bilateral uh, band and loops only if lingual arch is not possible. If lingual arch is possible or if lingual arch is in the option, then definitely you have to choose a lingual arch. Okay, I hope I am clear to you all. Am I clear to you? Lingulaj, I hope this question is clear. See, band and loop space maintainer is generally considered to be a unilateral space maintainer. Okay, band and loop can be given bilaterally if lingulaj is not possible. If and only if lingual arch is not possible, then only you give a bilateral band and loop. Otherwise, in the case of a bilateral space loss, you have to go ahead with a lingual arch appliance. The appliance of choice in bilateral space loss in the mandibular arch is lingual arch. Is that clear to you now? Whenever lingual arch... When is lingual, lingual arch is not, see lingual arch has got an arch extending to ex, that, that covers your uh, cingulum of your anterior tooth. If the anterior tooth is not erupted, then you cannot give a lingual arch. Then where will that uh, loop contact? No, you cannot give a lingual arch when the anterior tooth is not erupted. So if the anterior tooth is not erupted, that is given typically in my explanation. Okay, in the indications we have clearly mentioned it. If the anterior tooth is missing, then you can go for two bilateral band and loop. If the anterior tooth is fully erupted and uh, you have a bilateral space loss, you have to go for a lingual arch. So I hope I am clear to you all. Band and loop is given, yes, band, before eruption of the anterior, you, in the case of a bilateral space loss, you can give two bilateral band and loop. But if uh, anterior tooth is erupted, then you have to go for a lingual arch space maintainer. I hope I am clear to you. Which is a space maintainer of choice in the bilateral space loss in maxilla? In maxilla? Yes. Maxilla, bilateral space loss, you give a NANS palatal arch. So yes, that finishes today's brief description on space maintainer. So space maintainer is a very, very important topic for you. All of you have to read it thoroughly. So I've covered all the important aspects in space maintainers, which has been previously asked in all the NEAT papers, your AIPG and AIMS papers. So I hope I am clear to you all. And uh, the rest we can, uh, we'll be dealing in the contact classes. So I wish you all success. And yes, let's meet again in the contact sessions. And uh, tomorrow's webinar, you'll be having a webinar by Dr. Vipin Das, and uh, the subject will be on general surgery. So over to you, Dr. Hima. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful session. And if you want to join to our course, uh, please contact us in the number. Ma'am, can you change the slide? Okay, please contact on the number given below, and we'll be able to join in our classes. And the details will be provided to you once you call us, when you call us. And uh, tomorrow's the class will be on uh, by Dr. Vibhintas, and it will be on IV fluids. Thank you. Thank you.